The first guest of the evening is truly a poet. He's an artist. He is a, a friend and an inspiration to anyone who I think who has ever played the guitar uh, or tried to write poetry. Would you please welcome Gordon Lightfoot? <laughs> old Cape Horn, ships of the line, ships of the morn, some who've wished they'd never been born, they are the ghosts of Cape Horn. This is Carefree Highway Revisited, the show that celebrates the work of Gordon Lightfoot song by song, a proud member of the That's Not Canon podcast network. I'm your host, Mike Messner, and with me today is a fellow Lightfoot fan and one of my dearest friends from Oakland, California, Dave Stewart. Dave, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mike. I'm very, very happy to be here. How did you first get into Gordon Lightfoot's music? Originally, I was inspired to listen to Gordon because there was a rumor that Bruce Springsteen was an influence of his. I found that hard to wrap my mind around at the time because I was a young kid growing up in the 80s when I first heard about Bruce Springsteen. Mm -hmm. And Gordon Lightfoot came up because people were talking about it. And also... Bachman Turner Overdrive is one of my favorite bands and also Canadian musicians. Yeah. And of course, that came from uh, the remnants of the Guess Who. So there's another route there. Indeed. What do you like about Lightfoot's music generally? Well, for many, 60s music equates to the Beatles, Led Zeppelin, and the Rolling Stones. However, there are a lot of other great bands that a lot of times get passed over because it's, you know, so much attention goes to this really the big mainstream acts. Gordon Lightfoot represents a different genre of a very excellent style of music of the time. And like a lot of other great bands, the Animals, the Associations, the Hollies, Herman's Hermits, Questions in the Mysterians, Gordon Lightfoot, he's a folk icon and he writes music that is arranged and has metaphors and, and describes things about life and history and some of the very real aspects of it, as we'll find out when we talk about the lyrics. You mentioned that he writes arranged music, and it makes sense that he would do that because Gordon is a trained musician. I mean, he'd gone to college to be a band leader. So the sensibilities that he had, I mean, that's in his blood and it's under everything that he does. This is not somebody who grew up bashing away on a guitar in a garage band. I mean, he really does know what he's doing. It is very evident when you listen closely. Now, you wanted to talk about Ghosts of Cape Horn, which I discovered a little while back. I've really enjoyed this song because there's an air of mystery to it. And he's talking about supernatural ghosts, of course. There's history also. And of course, me being a professional historian, that rings my chimes. And of course, the fact that it's a folk song, which is, although Lightfoot's style has never really been categorized, okay, the influence is heavily folk. Why did you enjoy listening to it? And why did you want to talk about it? Well, I've been sailing around the San Francisco Bay here for the last 25 years, meeting a lot of people, going to a lot of parties, going on other people's boats, sailing with them. And this song kept coming up for many of the people. and. I decided that I should listen to it a little closer. And then I realized that it was a Gordon Lightfoot tune. And it made sense for a sailor. There's a lot of metaphors and the lyrics that you really only make sense if you've been at sea and taken weather on, on your own boat. I gotcha. And you being a sailor, we'll, we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Is there a setting, time of day, or a place that to you would be like the perfect environment in which to listen to Ghosts of Cape Horn? Oh, I would say it's just sailing. Yeah, I mean, it's a sailing song. Put it on. I think for me, I don't know if I'd be on a body of water, but I would probably be near a body of water, maybe sitting around a campfire at night. Maybe somebody's telling ghost stories because this is really in a sense, it is a ghost story within the song. So that's when I would want to be listening to it. So let's talk a little bit about how the song got written. This is one that Gordon was asked to write for a documentary film that came out in 1980. It's on YouTube, but it's also at the National Sailing Hall of Fame website. And the movie, although I've not seen it, is narrated by Jason Robards and was apparently pretty well received at the time. 
And it talks about sailing vessels making the trip around Cape Horn before the Panama Canal was built, which would have been, I think, in the 1910s. Now, Dave, you being a sailor, can you kind of enlighten us a little bit about where is Cape Horn and why there's such a mystique surrounding it? Well, it is the very southern tip of the South American continent. It is the end of known land that you can walk on until you have to swim to Antarctica, which is effectively (laughs) the bottom of the world. It's also south of the equator down there, the Pacific Ocean and the South Atlantic and all the water around Antarctica. It's so vast and expansive. It has been known to give people spiritual experiences, which I think partly connects to the ghost tales that you're mentioning. So it's all the way down there, the location of it, and because the ice of Antarctica and then you the southern warm currents coming down from the equator and the tropics creates a unique place for very, very powerful weather events. Now, for many, many years, they had no choice or they believed that they had no choice to sail around. However, in the early 1500s, Magellan discovered a passage that was able to avoid going around the very, very tip of the continent. And it was sort of an inland route that cut off a fairly significant amount of nautical miles from the voyage. It also gave you the opportunity to avoid or take shelter if there was a significant weather event. And that pretty much became the main thoroughfare shortly after Magellan charted it out and brought the information back to Spain. And as you say, it's at what is commonly known in the Tierra del Fuego, so the southern tip of Chile. Yes. Yet, even though the Straits of Magellan had been created in in the years, intervening years between Magellan's discovery and the creation of the Panama Canal, a lot of sailors still did try to make that voyage around Cape Horn, even though it wasn't necessarily the most convenient way to go. Interestingly enough, it became some sort of sacred rite of passage for the sailors. From my understanding of of the tales of I hear of men that have gone to sea and even the merchant marines of modern time consider navigating around the tip of Chile to be one of the fundamental rites of passage of becoming like a leveled up sailor. I like the way you said that a rite of passage. So you've reached a certain level of sailing capacity or ability if you've managed to navigate around Cape Horn. Exactly. Gotcha. We'll be right back to our conversation with Dave Stewart about ghosts of Cape Horn. But first, a word from a podcast partner or two. Hey, do you like classic albums? Technically, like, you know, the 20th century albums. Um, such as, like, Beatles, Led Zeppelin, <laughs> Rolling Stones. I've only had Beatle episodes so far, however, we will be doing more. But, welcome to my show, or rather, hey, welcome to, check out my show. <laughs> um, all those years ago, a classic album podcast with the dipping sauce. Um, as you can see, the Harry George Harrison reference. Um, I review classic albums. Um... Not of those, the likes of Beethoven, the likes of the Beatles and Rolling Stones, and like I mentioned earlier, uh, or what have you. <laughs> um, so yeah, check it out. It's every Monday. Um, I do albums, conspiracies, songs, all that jazz. So just check it out. All those years ago, a classic album podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs> Welcome to Books Boys! Every month, Nadine and PJ tell you all about the books they've been reading and make some recommendations from our old favorites, plus surprise call-ins from authors to talk about the works that they're writing, original music, prize giveaways, and more. That's Books Boys on BooksBoys.com and all good podcatchers. Books Boys, get it, buy it! Well, let's dive into the lyrics here. All around Old Cape Horn, ships of the line, ships of the morn. 
Now, ships of the morn clearly are fishing vessels that are getting out on the ocean early in the morning, probably before the sun comes up, because that's when the fish would be biting. But ships of the line, I'm not really sure what he means by that. Do you have an angle on it? Well, even back in the 1520s, there were shipping companies, much like we have today, that carried cargo and also letters and various supply ships that would sail around and sail out and bring supplies to like the whaling vessels, right? So they didn't have to come back to the port as often and they could continue to hunt for whales. One of them was named the Wellerman Line. Recently, I forget the fellow's name, but someone did a cover of it the last year or so and it became quite popular as a song for like a TikTok reel. The Wellerman Line. Yeah. The song is called The Wellerman. Okay. Well, maybe uh, some listeners can listen to that and then get back in touch with us about it. Some who wish they'd never been born, they are the ghosts of Cape Horn. Now, if you look at it grammatically, he would be referring to the ships, but obviously sailors refer to their ships as she, and they certainly feel a personal kinship with them. Do you think Gordon here is talking about ships, or is he talking about human beings? Oh, I think he's absolutely talking about the sailors, because most of these sailors came in from the fields looking for work because they were hungry and had no idea about anything about the water. And four days into their new job, they find themselves in the middle of the ocean. And some of them took to it and became very successful and others straight up didn't make it. And they were miserable, miserable because they were far from home. They were homesick. They were seasick. And probably, you know, if you're feeling all of those things, there's probably a good reason you would say, God, I wish I was never born. Yeah. Then we get some onomatopoeia, which is fal dural da riddle dee rum with a rim dim ditty and a rum dum dum. It sounds like just about every other cliched sailing tune that you've ever heard. And it's very well placed in the middle of this song. Sailing away at the break of dawn, they are the ghosts of Cape Horn. And ships are leaving early in the morning to make the use of the daylight and the wind. And is it also the tide? And I pardon my ignorance on this, I'm not a sailor, but is the fact that they're getting up that early, does that have to do with the tide as much with anything else? Absolutely. I would say that it is probably one of the main reasons that they're getting up early. For hundreds of years, the celestial motion of the moon and whatnot hasn't really changed a whole lot. And it just turns out that most of the time, if you want to catch the tide that you need to get somewhere, you got to get up early to do it. That makes perfect sense. Why any sailing trip that I've ever taken, okay, they're weighing anchor very early in the morning. See them all in sad repair, divans dance everywhere. Now, you get the impression that if you went diving in Cape Horn to see the shipwrecks, you'd see, you know, the wreckage of these things. But then when we were talking before we went on the air, you had another angle on the sad repair aspect of it. Tell us about that. Well, boats are a very special thing, and taking care of them is unlike taking care of anything else you'll ever encounter in your life. And as a result, a lot of them get abandoned by their humans, and they are left in marinas and boatyards all over the place in the back corners of some of the strangest mangroves you'll find, abandoned and effectively soulless. I like the way you said that. And that's kind of a sad commentary. I guess that would happen when people just can't afford to go sailing anymore, because I can't imagine that you get so tired of sailing that you just can't do it. But maybe you're physically incapable of doing it or you're economically incapable of doing it. A lot of it is people get too old and just can't physically do it anymore because it is quite demanding. And also... It seems like it's one of these things that not as many people are interested in it as they used to be. I imagine it is certainly expensive and it is taxing if you're going to be out for a long period of time. And in very particular, if you're doing classic wooden sailboats, which is the kind that I've been on and of course you've been on. Southern gales, tattered sails and none to tell the tales. And I think those are just the realities of sailing, you know, that there are going to be gales that are going to toss your ship, tattered sails, meaning that they're going to tear with wind or with any other natural effects, and none to tell the tales because ships do break up and 
people are lost at sea. I don't know how much it happens these days, but I think he threw that in just to remind people, look, this is part of sailing on the high seas. Is that a sentiment you would agree with? I think so. The statement itself pretty much is self-explanatory. They had some bad weather and nobody lived. And it does happen, but it doesn't happen to everyone. Most people that sail go through their entire life never really experiencing a major weather event. But every once in a while, some poor soul gets stuck in the wrong place at the wrong time and none to tell the tales. Yeah. And we read that in history books and we see it in documentaries like this. So now the song goes into a 3-4 groove, very different from the rest of the song. And I almost thought that these were two different songs that could almost stand on their own. Come all of you rustic old sea dogs who follow the bright Southern Cross. Now, Dave, the Southern Cross is something that's probably spoken about in literature and poetry, but what is it and why would anyone who's out at sea follow it? Well, first of all, let's definitely establish that it's absolutely a legitimate constellation. It's called Cracks, K-R-A-K-S, and it's, it's actually Latin for cross. Oh, now, okay. The southern equator aspect of it, it is literally a cross up in the sky on the very south end of the Milky Way, and it is used as a celestial navigation waypoint at night for when they didn't have compasses. So this was a way that they got around knowing that they were more or less on course yeah. by following this array of stars that it's up there. And you said it was called the Cracks constellation? Yeah, okay. and it, it looks like a cross that's sort of unique in that of the stars that form the constellation are all about equally bright and brighter than a majority of the stars around them. So it's really just a celestial landmark almost. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the North Star. Got it. You were rounding the horn in the eye of a storm when you lost her one day and you read all your letters from oceans away, then you took them to the bottom of the sea. Now, these are probably the letters from the shipping lines that you mentioned yes. a minute ago. So they found these ships that were doing whatever, exploring, looking for buried treasure, goodness knows what else. And they actually found these ships on the high seas and said, hey, we've got some mail for you, and we've got fresh water, and we've got other supplies. And you get the impression that the sailors would just absolutely treasure these letters and then just read them again and again and again and would never let go of them. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. That was their main source of entertainment. We'll be right back to our conversation with Dave Stewart about ghosts of Cape Horn. But first, a word from a podcast partner or two. Is that song really a cover? What instrument are they playing there? What do those crazy lyrics mean? If you're the kind of person who thinks about stuff like that, you're in luck because I've got just the podcast for you. How Good It Is chooses a single song each episode and takes a dive into the story behind the song and the artist who made it famous. I'm Claude Call. You can find me in your favorite podcast software or just point your browser to howgooditis.com. How good it is. Hello, I'm JT, a lifelong student of the paranormal and the unexplained. I've spent over 35 years researching and learning about a wide range of subjects, from UFOs and cryptids to ghosts and the supernatural, from hidden and lost treasures to mankind's mysterious past, and all other things mysterious and Fortean. Each week, I'll bring you some relevant and interesting articles in this genre, as well as a different topic, some you may be familiar with, but many you most likely will never have known existed. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. And let me be your tour guide as we explore the unexplained on the paranormal sun. Then the next uh, bridge goes, Come all you old sea dogs from Devon, Southampton, Penzance, and Kinsale. And those are all coastal cities or port cities in the British Isles, either in England or Ireland. You were caught by the chance of a sailor's last dance. And you had mentioned earlier that the sailors during the age of exploration, you know, they were hungry, they wanted to get off the farm. So they were really sort of casting their lot with this new career. The way I thought of it is that some of them may have realized that they might not be coming back from this, the chance of a sailor's last dance. Do you get the impression that they 
went out on these voyages realizing that this may be the last time they ever see their loved ones? Some of them probably had a pretty good idea. Some of them didn't have anything better to go back to. So for them, it didn't really matter. It wasn't like the economy was booming back in those days. <laughs> no, I mean, certainly not as many opportunities for the people that we're talking about here. Absolutely. It was not meant to be, and you read all your letters, cried anchor away, then you took them to the bottom of the sea. And then it repeats the chorus, and then he gets out. So the song was on the Dream Street Rose album, which came out in 1980. It was the second track on the record. It was not released as a single, which I can understand, because in 1980, there were so many changes going on in music that a folk song like this was not going to be making the charts on its own. But the album did go to 76 in Australia, number one on the Canadian country charts, number nine on the top albums in Canada, 58 on the Billboard country albums, and 60 in the U.S. Billboard 200. So the album certainly made a mark. It just wasn't as big a hit for him as other songs that he had done. They had the usual lot, okay, Lightfoot on vocals and guitar, Clements on lead guitar, Haynes on bass, Pee Wee Charles on pedal steel, Barry Keane on drums, and then there was a piano player who was listed, but I can't hear a piano on this song at all. He's played the song 104 times in concert, according to setlist.fm, starting in July of 1976, and then most recently in August 2006. So he has not played it in the last 15 or 16 years. There's only one official cover that I can find, and that's by Tim Dabbs. Dave, is there anybody that you would like to hear do this song either from contemporary music or from artists that are no longer around or no longer performing? Well, I'm glad that I got a chance to look at some of the questions that you were going to ask me before we actually came on and did the show, <laughs> because I had to really think about this one. And after going through some of my old CDs and listening to some of my favorite female vocalists that I happen to have available, I decided uh, Atlantis Morissette might do a fantastic job in this one. Boy, she would have a, re it would have a whole new ethereal quality if Alanis were to do it because of the nature of her voice. I don't know how active a performer she is anymore, but when you go back to Jagged Little Pill, her voice really did have a certain timbre to it. I would have liked to have heard the Cranberries do it, mostly because they are an Irish band, and this certainly has a Celtic flavor to it. Unfortunately, we may never get the chance to hear either Alanis or the Cranberries do it, but it's a nice idea. Dave, you mentioned earlier that you're a sailor and you've been sailing around the bay for the last 25 years. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got bitten by the sailing bug, where that comes from, and how often you're involved with it? Well, I grew up next to the water, born here in Oakland, California, and I spent most of my life next to the Pacific Ocean. I've always been fascinated by the sea. John Steinbeck and Doc Ricketts are two of my favorite authors. But the actual sailing part obviously takes an interest in the ocean to even want to get near it or even on it. I um, wasn't quite sure how I was going to explore that. And I was working my first real job that I got in the mid-90s. One of the people that I worked with lived aboard a sailboat in Sausalito. And I started asking questions about the boat and how he lived aboard and what it was like. I'm sure he found it super annoying initially, but he took it upon himself to take me sailing around the bay one day. And pretty much that's when I decided that I wanted to do a lot more of it. So from there, I started just trying to find ways to get on boats, in boats, around boats, close to boats, talk about boats, learn about boats, fix boats. <laughs> Now, have you actually experienced sailing around Cape Horn yet? No. I wouldn't say it's something that's in my bucket list. I would okay. absolutely do it, given the opportunity. I would have my bags packed. But I don't foresee myself doing it on my own sailboat. Dave, as we're kind of winding down here, any other closing thoughts you have on the song or if you've heard the album, the album sort of writ large? Just kind of the circle back around how I kind of got introduced to the song 
at first because it, it like like we were saying i had no idea it was gordon lightfoot i only just heard it like in various sailing bars and aboard people's boats and the occasional yacht club band would play it the fact that this sort of iconic song that's engraved in culture around here at least would be a gordon lightfoot tune it makes me smile that kind of says it all because Lightfoot has been making people smile with his music for many, many, many years. And the man is now in his 80s and he's still not stopping. This is really one of the catchier ones that he's ever done. I'd like to make a special request for you to visit my Patreon page. I love this show so much and I want to keep it going. And you're in a position to help. Please head over to www.patreon.com slash carefreehighwayrevisited. A dollar or two a month is all I ask. You can reach me, Mike Messner, at teachermike72 at gmail.com. And thanks for listening, everybody. If you like this well enough to listen to the whole thing, tell somebody about it. Carefree Highway Revisited is on Apple, Spotify, Acast, or wherever you get your listening matter. Our website is www.lightfootpodcast.com. Dave Stewart, it's been a pleasure to talk to you tonight. As I alluded to, you're one of my oldest and dearest friends. You and I were roommates in college, and it's always great to talk about anything musical or sailing related with you. So thank you for taking the time tonight. Well, Mike, you're very welcome. I very much appreciate the opportunity to be on your show and very grateful that you had me tonight. And good luck on your next event. Well, that next event will feature my guest, John McLaughlin, making his second appearance on the podcast. And he will be talking about looking at the rain from the Don Quixote album in the second week of November. Until then, this is Mike Messner reminding you, run for the roses, but don't forget to stop and smell them. We'll see you next time.